Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse, your podcast from the Macquarie University English Department. So I'm here today um, with Dr. Michelle Hammerdash. I'm Dr. Stephanie Russo and today we're going to be talking about Margaret Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale, which seems to have quite had quite a resurgence in popularity recently. It seems to be um, going back up the New York Times best-selling list over 30 years after it was originally published for reasons that we may go into a bit later. Um, there's also going to be a adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale coming out next month in April, so that might be something that you might look out for after our discussion. So Michelle, what did you think of The Handmaid's Tale? Look, Stephanie, um, I was absolutely... Um, enthralled by The Handmaid's Tale um, from beginning to end uh, in, in a way that was not immediately expected because I think for me stepping back and, 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 and looking at uh, The Handmaid's Tale and really sort of trying to get my head around um, Margaret Atwood's sort of project with this one um, has just completely and utterly sort of sent my head into um, <laughs> a whir of activity. Uh, and, and just to get us started, I, I have to ask you, what, what do we think about Offred? And when I say that, I mean her, the style of her narration, mm -hmm. you know, sort of that cool, detached, um, sort of almost impersonal tone. Um, you know, sort of the distance in 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 that in in that narration, which I think is is a marked departure from, say, um, Winston in 1984, for example. Mm. Um, you know, what 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 is? Uh, and I think there's an unreliability mm. to to Offred um, that is very much a deliberate strategy on the part of of, of Atwood. And so I, I I just have to ask you, what what do you think? It's such a brilliant read, isn't it? The, every time I read this, and I've read this many times, it strikes me anew how relevant it is and how more relevant it's becoming, strangely enough. Um, in terms um, of your question and in relation to offer it, um, I think that's, as you say, quite a purposeful strategy because I think that kind of um, very kind of cool detached narration really demonstrates how much Offred's character has been kind of flattened and beaten down by this society in which they live, in which, you know, even her name, she's of Fred, she has no identity of her own, she's just a, a vassal, um, she's a tool, she's not valued in for her own identity and you can see in her narration how she's taken that on and how what she was before which was, you know, she was living in a society that looked kind of much like ours, um, has has really been destroyed. I, I mean, I guess in many respects, the offered uh, that we're we're given um, by Atwood is is very much, you know, sort of Winston post, yeah. you know, sort of hit post uh, his, his 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 traumatic brainwashing. That's right. Um, yeah. So I, I think you know it's it's a brilliant strategy mm. on the part of Atwood to do that. Uh, and I think the other thing that I'm always in awe of with Atwood is, is her incredible, and I think it's her poetic mm. background, you know, sort of her, I don't think she ever ceases to be the poet mm. with her understanding of, of how to pack, you know, sort of single words with, with just sort of almost um, sort of infinite uh, connotations, all of which pack a punch. Because, mm. you know, you say offered and you say of Fred, yeah. but you also say offered as in someone who's offered up. And, and then we also have this incredible play um, on the letter O, which, you know, sort mm. of in terms of feminist, mm. um, you know, sort of in terms of fem feminist pro approaches, in terms of, of germinal texts from feminists, you know, the O mm. um, is without doubt the, 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 the perfect letter of the alphabet <laughs> to, to start with. Absolutely, and I mean another thing that really strikes me too that, that goes alongside that um, observation that Margaret Atwood is always a poet is just how brilliantly constructed the outfits that they wear are with oh. the hoods and the and the red. And I noted the other day that um, in relation to this adaptation that's coming out shortly um, at the South by Southwest festival, the producers of the of this adaptation had dressed some women like this and sort of paraded them through the festival in order to kind of get publicity and it, it backfired on them because it's such a kind of 
weird and strange and scary image of, of women dressed like that so that their faces are completely shielded. Um, they can't see beyond a kind of very narrow um, window and they're wearing these robes. It, it was so unnerving that that publicity stuff kind of backfired because it's just such a, a loaded kind of image of, of women kind of tamped down and, and repressed. So I think that she works in such kind of brilliant um, images and brilliant references that just underline the, the real frightening aspect of this society that, that Offred's part of. Um, and, and I think that it is that constant play between, you know, sort of the details from the real mm. that get reimagined and recontextualised within the fabric of this narration that makes it so mm. um, sort of absolutely um, visceral in, mm. in, 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 in its exploration. And, you know, sort of one of the things that I, I, I feel happens throughout the narrative is, is that there's this um, sort of... Uh, uh, I, ironically, because we were just talking about dressing, but mm. but it just this complete um, enterprise to strip everything, um, to strip everything bare, so that you know, sort of not 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 the the sort of the the bra burning, book burning feminist, mm. you know, sort of not uh, you know, sort of the the religious um, fundamentalists. The um, the academic, yeah. Every single one of them, in in some sense, is 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 stripped um, bare, mm -hmm. leaving you with this question, um, which I, I I think is actually part mm -hmm. of um, sort of Margaret Atwood's um, sort of enterprise uh, of well, in actual fact, you know, sort of we can't work towards. Uh, you know, sort of the the utopia. We can't work towards the um, dystopia. We can't work. To w it's always and only um, that that sort of in, in endeavour to, to to sort of critique, to question, mm. and to absolutely the only thing that can't be relinquished is you know sort of sort of that question. And and I, I guess there I'm thinking about that fantastic. Uh, sort of line towards the end where she says um, <laughs> with uh, well uh, the, 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 the faux academic um, sort <laughs> of at, uh, at, at a brilliantly imagined seminar which you know sort of many uh, of us <laughs> would be it all seems too real doesn't it <laughs> well except that I think how many of us would have been thankful for a day to go fishing um, <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of at, 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 at a conference um, we have this moment where uh, she says in the, um, the the historical section of it, our job is not to censure but to understand. Mm. And it, that is such a, a, a loaded uh, sort of comment when we think about the world of, of Gilead, mm. which if it doesn't require some form of censure, that's right, absolutely. You know, censuring, I don't know what does. Um, what, 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 what do you think in terms of Well, I that? think that what, I, what always strikes me about this novel is the aunts at, at some stage in the novel tell Offred and the other, um, the other handmaidens um, that what is important about this society is not freedom to but freedom from. And that's always struck me as really central to the novel because what this society has set itself up as um, is an opportunity for women to be protected, right? To be protected from um, going out and being sexually assaulted, from not, not having a place in the world. So it set itself up as a place in which women are, are nominally safe. But of course, what we know and can see is that, of course, that, that it's nothing, it's not a feminist project at all. It's, it's quite the opposite. And so I think when we get to that um, academic discussion of this society and in which they're kind of discussing it in a very kind of dry academic way as if it's a kind of in the way that we're kind of doing now as if it's a fictional construct but to them it's real um, I think that they're doing the same thing almost to offer it they're, they're sort of stripping her identity out from her and recreating her as an object of study um, and, and sort of looking at it in this dispassionate way that doesn't allow her to um, be a kind of real human being that has to navigate in this world and so it, to me it manifests that kind of distinction between freedom to and freedom from 
that essential to the project of Gilead. So it almost seems to me to be in this kind of strange way of replicating Gilead, even though the social conditions have obviously changed in this um, in this academic footnote where we know that it's many years in the future. Look, absolutely, and I think it it, it becomes a marked um, you know sort of and an, an incredibly um, sort of timely critique of cultural relativism. Absolutely, and, yes. And, you yes. know, sort of the way that when we have just in the most sort of, um, uh, in the most detailed and, and fully imagined way been exposed to the story of someone who has, have, has been stripped mm. of, of past, mm. of, of, of autonomy, of, of everything, um, that one could stand back and, 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 and say we must only understand. Yes, we must. We must try to understand where they were coming from. And, and yeah. there are those sort of startling glimpses where there are visitors. That's right. There are tourists. Gilead. Yeah, there are tourists tour- tour- yeah. to Gilead who somehow occupy this space where they are not actually subject to the same rules as Gilead. Mm-hmm. They've been permitted inside of Gilead. And yet these these tourists, uh, are, are, as you say, doing nothing more than observing from from a position of, of sort of safe distance and mm. objectivity, which which I think you know sort of given the you know sort of the very real um, you know sort of uh, impact that particularly religious fundamentalism has had on women mm. historically, culturally, um, you know sort of geographically, present past. Uh, is is a really vital aspect of, of what's being questioned in um, The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that image of the tourists coming in and looking at them as if they were a carnival attraction, um, as if they're kind of women who, who exist in a kind of zoo, I think is, it's so powerful and it really speaks to, to Atwood's um, genius, really. And, I mean, Atwood has talked quite openly um, and extensively over the past kind of 30 years since the publication of the novel about how what she's doing in this novel is not actually making up a vision of her potential future dystopia, but she's taking ideas and discourses and ways of thinking that already exist about women and she's putting them all together in her own kind of creative way. But it's not like the sanctions on dressing, the sanctions on sexual behaviour, the ranking of different women according to their fun- it's not like according to their function, it's not like those things don't exist. So what she's doing is she's taking those ideas and putting them all together and saying, well this is the kind of um, natural extension. If you take those kind of theories and run them to their kind of most obvious practical application, this is what it looks like. This is this is what we get. And so for example she talks a lot about um, how she, you know, I've read interviews in which she talks about how she took inspiration from like the witch hunts of the of the Puritan, the 17th century Puritanism, and how that was part of um, what fed into her novel, as well as kind of more contemporary discussions in the in the 1980s when there was a, a you know kind of a backlash against second wave feminism. She really takes these things and runs them together in ways that makes that I think account for our response that it's almost too realistic, it's almost too relatable, it's almost too present to us. I mean, I think it's a very scary book because it is too likely. Look, I I think it's absolutely a a Mm. terrifying read because, you know, sort of, I think it's very easy for it to be read as, you know, sort of speculative fiction, isn't that, you know, Mm. um, imaginative and creative and... um, We would never do that kind of thing, yeah. But when you stop and pause at any one of those um, sort of reimaginings and, and often they're, they're not even <laughs> really no. reimagined. They are no. actually literal sort of recontextualizations, mm. or you know, sort of a, it's Atwood's ability to defamiliarize. Yeah, that's right. You know, sort of the the, the the very fabric of our lives. That if we sort of rest with it, and, and if we think in terms of you know, sort of that um, you know, sort of such a, a, an in, incredibly um, thorough. Uh, sort of deconstruction mm. of, um, as you say, all of the, the the threads that are existent right now in mm. this, this very moment. Then you you know sort of right down to the academy. Yeah, that's and right. And the academy is not excluded. And I think that's you know sort of where um, you know sort of her, her her brilliance lies is 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 that she's not afraid of, or she's not afraid to risk 
you know, sort of that, that final chapter, mm. um, which is a risk on so many levels. That's um, right. Even, you know, on a kind of novel-based narrative level, it's a risk, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. In order to, you know, sort of say the, the one thing mm. that um, will, you know, the, the, the one thing that has to be maintained, mm. you know, sort of is ultimately, and, and, you know, this is where, you know, I think we've said this before, I love literature because yeah, in some sense right. it is a literary <laughs> reading of anything, that ability to to be critical, to think about things in terms of analogy, to think about things in terms of, you know, just very much to think analogically around these things that allows that ultimate sort of moment that anything that shackles, uh, and then I think particularly, um, you know, sort of whether that's religious sort of um, mm. fundamentalism or academic, um, y- y- you know, sort of... Um, fashions or trends, That's anything right. that shackles the ability to think independently, critically, mm. and anything that sort of fences off anything as untouchable or as beyond reproach mm. is always going to be threatening, um, ultimately. Well, that's right. And I think that what um, Atwood is doing is, is kind of skewering all of those institutions from a kind of number of directions. And um, what also strikes me... Um, as interesting about this world is that, as you say, it's not actually even a leap. It's not actually a leap at all. The discourse that surrounds women in this society, for example, in terms of reproductive rights, that's not a leap. It's just an exploration of the discourse that is already there. And so it seems to me to be very much um, putting it in the, in the basket of speculative fiction and, and kind of saying, okay, well, this is an, a, an imagined future seems to me to be kind of missing the point because what she's doing is using literature to tease out these kind of implications of the kind of public discourse that we already have. So it seems to me to be very much about institutions, about public language, about discourse and about the effects that they have on the way in which people live their lives. And I think one of the scariest things to me is when we see um, the flashbacks to Offred's previous existence where she's been a wife and a mother and she's lived a life that's kind of roughly analogous to ours, um, how quickly everything is taken away. So all of a sudden she doesn't have access to her money, for example. Um, All of a sudden she can't go to work. And that happens over, and the way it's narrated is that it happens over, you know, a couple of weeks basically and her life is is totally upended so quickly and it makes you realise how kind of thin the boundary is between the way we live and the way that they live. It's it's really um, pointing at the kind of weakness of these institutions that are supposedly there to protect us, how quickly they can be deconstructed. I think it's it is a, it's a chilling um, you know sort of moment and and I was, as as you were speaking I was listening to the week you know mm. I was listening to that's the right week. yeah <laughs> and the t- the two things that I thought was you know sort of the precariousness mm. uh, and also as you sort of mentioned before the present tense because you remove someone's um, sort of ability to have financial independence and it doesn't necessarily have to be at a legislative level. No, that's right. I mean, when we look at the reality behind, um, you know, sort of the world that we live in, Mm. um, if you don't have access to um, sort of financial independence, Mm. which is, you know, it, it, it is... Uh, statistically, um, pretty much almost the majority experience of women, because we're always mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, 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 the wages of women are less, they're more likely to occupy mm. the casual workforce, um, they're more likely to have been out of a workforce, which prevents them from getting back in. So in actual fact, that that choice, you know, sort of that we, that, that, that sort of mm. moment at which we feel as though we have our, um, you know, sort of autonomy is very much based on a number of things that are only accessible to a very small proportion of women right now. Well, Um, absolutely. And I think that there's, you know, I mentioned at the the beginning of this podcast that 
this book is, is going is shooting back up the New York Times bestselling list, and I think that's not an accident. I mean, it's been around for 30 years, as I said, and it's you know always been in print. It's always been something that's been read. It's become a feminist classic. But I think it definitely does speak to our times. It, it speaks to a contemporary moment of fear around um, what's happening in the United States and so forth, um, especially in relation to the comments um, that President Trump made about um, women. I still can't really say President Trump without having a moment of kind of panic. Um, but it, 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 it speaks to that kind of um, anxiety around what is actually happening in the world and what potentially could happen in the world and how precarious things are. And as you said, I think that we, um, although I wasn't kind of conscious of saying we, um, I think it's not accidental that I said we. No, and, yeah. and, and, and I think that uh, one of the things, and this is this is why, you know, sort of I will probably live my life <laughs> as, you know, sort of someone dedicated to the pursuit of, 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 of literature and the literary, mm. is because in actual fact, you know, sort of um, what Atwood manages to do is she manages to simultaneously present us with not only, um, you know, sort of the... the, the um, a, a, a feminist novel, okay, but she also manages to give us the internal contradictions, mm. the complexity, the impossibility, mm. and yet the necessity. And and I think that's what you know, sort of, a, a, what is missing in in a lot of the um, in 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 a lot of the in, in a lot of the discourses today mm. is is the fact that both the impossibility and the necessity actually reside together. Yeah. And so while just as it's impossible to talk about a we mm. because, you know, sort of women's experiences are so radically different and, mm. and they are radically different. Um, and Atwood doesn't try and disguise mm. that or, or paint it over or sort of portray this picture of women sort of just working together in a sort of a community of No, peace. absolutely not, yeah. Um, you know, sort of some of the, the most um, sort of vicious tensions are between women. So, you know, sort of at the same time, whereas there isn't that we, at the same time, we absolutely can't lose the we that is the, 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 of the feminist um, sort of enterprise because as that would show so beautifully, mm. um, you know, sort of, uh, sort of, patriarchies don't just hurt women. That's right. They hurt men. I mean, some of the most savagely treated characters are the ones who are men, mm. who 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 have been strung up outside, you know, sort of the walls of the building in a way that's both chillingly, mm. um, sort of redolent of, of of slaves times in America yeah. um, is so chillingly sort of um, redolent of um, you, you know sort of times past but all, also of not distant pr and I think this is the thing that Atwood is saying to us these are not distant realities these, mm -hmm. are, these are very close to us and there's a hair's breadth between us and a lot of it just resides in our ability to handle you know sort of that complexity of there being a, a sort of a fem feminist enterprise yeah. and at the same time the impossibility of that. Well, I think that that's what, I mean, that gets to your point about why we read literature because it's a book that takes on all of these ideas and it's taking on many ideas from a wide variety of kind of social um, discourses and, and uh, ways of understanding the world and it's, it's bringing them together in, in an incredibly complex way that helps us to understand our own world that allows us to think through those complexities even though it seems to be about a world that's kind of quite distant from us in terms of social organisation. Um, I just wanted to return to your point about the kind of ways women are set up against each other because I think that's something that's really interesting about the novel. The women aren't set up to be allies. They're not set up to be um, friends. They're, the whole world is set up so that women are pitched against each and pitted against each other. And that's also true of our own world, isn't it? Mm. But it's very kind of obvious... Um, in this novel, the way in which somebody like Offred is, is set up against Serena, the, the wife, even by their clothing. Mm -hmm. So it's a world that supposedly is the way they frame it to themselves in their kind of um, you know historical justification for why they're doing all of this is that we're, we're trying to protect you, we're trying to you know um, put you in safety, we're trying to shore up the future, we're trying to you know make sure children are born into this world and that they're protected and everybody has their own place. But all it's doing is pitting woman against woman and man against man in this rigidly hierarchical world that again is not that far a hair's breadth away from our own. 
Look, and, and I think that's one of the other things that is, you know, sort of, um, you know, it, we, it's a deliberate strategy mm. that as readers we're not being invited to take off our critical hat. Mm. You know, there's no way that, you know, sort of Atwood is, is sort of making us feel warm and cosy in this story so no. that we can just follow the, 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 the story of Offred unproblematically. Mm. And I think, you know, sort of one of, as, and I think you mentioned this before, um, both the vision of... Um, Offred's past, mm. which is sort of, I guess, roughly equivalent to the real of today or of the 80s at any rate, um, as much as, um, you know, sort of, and, and I think this is where she sort of one ups um, Orwell. Yes. Okay, <laughs> is because, you know, not only does she give us a sort of a nostalgic longing for that past but she also rejects that nostalgic longing because we can already see you know sort of the 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 the, the, the seeds of the of of, of um, you know sort of the, the very problematic aspects of things like for example the relationship between Offred and Moira that's right and the uh, relationship between Offred and mother mm. you know sort of and and then also the the very sort of um, I think one of the moments where I have a, a, a sort of a, a, a flashback is the point at which um, Offred's wages have been frozen mm. and her husband is, is kind of sort of indifferent, it's alright, I'm going to look after you. Mm. And you see right there and then that at no point in this, you know, sort of supposedly liberated world has that, um, you know, sort of husband character figure mm. really profoundly understood the degree to which, you know, sort of that autonomy and independence was, um, you know, sort of absolutely integral to any person's being, not just a woman. I think that what's startling about the way her husband behaves is how quickly he slips back into that patriarchal um, mode where he says to her, you know, as you said, um, I'm going to take care of you. And he's doing that in a kind of benevolent way, but it, it, it does demonstrate a complete lack of understanding of, of how threatened she would be in that moment and how um, her personality, her identity, her independence has been taken away from her. It's all very well to have your husband say, "Well, don't worry, I'll take care of you." But what what she what is really happening to her is that she's been completely um, stripped of any kind of independent existence um, outside of him. And I think that um, a point that I'd like to kind of come back to as well is that nobody is immune from Atwood's criticism. She really writes the scalpel because she has a go at second wave feminists as well. Um, part of what she demonstrates in demonstrating the flashbacks to, to Offred's mother is that there were these kind of take back the night marches and so forth going on in this world um, prior to the Republic of Gilead um, and what she does is she equips Gilead with the ability to say to the second wave kind of feminist stand-ins you wanted to be safe in this world you wanted women to have the ability to go outside and to walk down the street and not feel sexual um, pressure or, or feel like you're vulnerable in a sexual level. So here you go. You've got it, right? You're safe. You're protected. You have a, um, a very specific role in the house. And uh, I think it's important that we can't, we, we can't forget that the way that the handmaids are framed is that they are really very valuable, right? So even though we see their role as, you know, terrible, you know, terribly oppressive and, and a nightmarish kind of existence, they're told constantly that they're valuable, that they're important, that they're safe, they're protected, that they have a really um, valuable and important place in society because obviously they have to bear the children. This society is going to collapse unless a second um, or third generation of, of children is, is brought up. Um, so there's all of this rhetoric is being thrown back in the face of feminists. Well, it also allows you to draw that parallel between the book burning of, you know, sort of, of, of what was it that they're burning, the, they're burning the pornography, they're burning the this, they're burning the that, yeah. and then the very act of censorship that um, Gilead is, is, is also performing in terms of, you know, sort of 
well, we can't occupy sort of re readers' minds with books and things like that, you know, because right. it, it might sort of take away from their fertility, um, you know. But but also, obviously, it's a world where everything, in you know, from the Vogue um, magazine, is also forbidden, mm. um, has been uh, censored, and and so in in a sense, you know, in that marvelous way that um, you know, sort of literature does, we get that parallel. Um, between you know sort of any form of um, censorship um, and the, the, the fact that really and truly um, uh, the existence of pornography is not um, sort of tackled or controlled um, mm -hmm. by the burning of books, the burning of um, there were there were other things that were burnt on that pyre. Yeah. And and I think um, you know it's as you say, uh, she is relentless mm. in and and I think you know sort of I, I, I it, 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 it is a very strong moment and I think it's because it it, it it so strongly resonates with today is that I think that husband mm. um, inability to um, you know sort of understand the significance of what's happened mm. I actually think is probably the most profound metaphor mm. of um, of the book for today because I think what um, we're witnessing is we're, wi we're witnessing an era that demonstrates that we have not actually fully understood what um, you know sort of the, the, the fact that in, in, in many respects um, the citizen is still always and already, first and foremost, um, male. Absolutely, and, and constructed as, as the default is male and the aberration or the other is, is women um, or is and woman. The unwoman. Um, and the unwoman. And the unwoman, which... Yeah, the unwoman, the, the women who... Um, the politicised women, the you know, angry feminists who are, have now been pretty much turfed out of society to work in you know, some kind of weird form of labour camp. <laughs> um, and, and that, again, there's a historical parallel, you know, women throughout history who have been different, who have been unruly, who have been um, sexually dissenting. active or dissenting, are all constantly called um, un, un women. I, I My background is 18th century literature and one of the kind of uh, key poems that I, I keep coming back to is called The Unsexed Females. And that was this poem written in the late 18th century about basically a group of women who got involved in politics around the time of the French Revolution and because they did, because they were kind of dissenting voices and they were daring to involve themselves in politics they were, were thought to have stripped the, the kind of um, their sex from them, that they'd become men or unsexed females because they had um, dared to intervene in spaces that weren't theirs, which is exactly what Ma what Margaret Atwood is picking up. I mean, even think of, you know, um, Lady Macbeth, unsex me now, and um, etc. So I think that un, un women, um, just even using that term, I think is really loaded with these kinds of historical um, connotations that demonstrate we're still worried about these things. I mean, and censorship and fears about what women read. We still see that all the time. What are women reading? Are they reading, you know, rubbish? Are they going to get stupid ideas from their books? No one seems to worry about what men read, of course. <laughs> what, um, what women read, and especially what young women, teenage girls read, is a hugely a source of concern today. Look, and, and you know, as, as I say, I think that um, Atwood as a poet, uh, you know, sort of, she invites us to look at language mm. in a way that makes it quite chilling. And I can't help, <laughs> you know, but when I see that unwoman, mm. um, actually just see the word woman. Yeah. Um, which I think when we when we when we sit, when we think through, um, you know, sort of that prevailing, um, you know, sort of that that that, that prevailing discourse there, um, you know, we, we sort of have, and and I think it makes it sort of I think as a, as a way of sort of thinking through it, you know, sort of sort of thinking about it and making it as relevant as possible to today. We think about it as you know, sort of men are effectively. Citizen, mm. and you know, sort of, you could almost have a sort of a, a synonymous relationship between men and citizens That's and right. citizenship. 
and then women as always being in some sense supplementary mm. to that citizenship by being by um, you know sort of value of that woman sort mm. of moment which I think um, uh, Atwood underlines with her brilliant unwoman um, because I was actually half the way through I was thinking you know I actually think maybe we shouldn't call ourselves men maybe we should just call ourselves unmen you know and just <laughs> just be done, just be done with it you know and that might sort of give the message and sort of underline that fact that when we begin with the enterprise of you know sort of excluding um, you know sort of you know sort of particular groups or particular you mm-hmm. know sort of whether that's based on 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 sex on 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 you know sort of um, sexuality, whether it's mm. based on race, whether it's based on nationhood, whether it's based on this. As soon as we start doing that, you know, sort of the whole enterprise of what it means to be human is actually at stake. And in terms of um, sort of anyone who's sort of wondering why is feminist feminism relevant, mm. you know, I, I think that's it right there and then because it mm. occupies that space that allows us to understand that, you know, sort of any time that somebody is made sort of contingent, supplementary, um, you know, sort of in, is in some way marked as other, mm. um, in actual fact, there are things going on that need interrogation. Well, exactly, and this is a society that is, is affirming and shoring up the privilege and power of the white man. Absolutely. He is, the white man is, is at the centre of this world. And again, to go back to that point about the names, the names reflect the power of the white man. So to be an Offred, to be an Offred is to automatically be othered and to have no capacity to not be othered and to, and to not be considered. It, it, it demonstrates a, a lack of consideration of the humanity of that woman. But once again, it's actually not that different to what happens. Absolutely. Because, you know, sort of patronymic... That's system, right. You, you give know. up your name when you get married. So, well, and most even people if you still don't, do. It's, it's, yeah. still, it's still your father's name. That's right. And, you know, yet that is something that is completely and utterly, you know, sort of off the charts. In terms and no one, of, no, nobody, nobody wants to address it, really. Nobody, I mean, yeah. a hyphen doesn't really do it. Well, um, and I mean, there has been, you know, a kind of more women are kind of keeping their names. But it doesn't seem to be like a topic of conversation. You know, why is it that a family is, is only sort of formed when the... the wife and children have taken on the name of the father and here we have and we see that that these women take on the name of their their you know protector or um, patriarchal figure within the family and we're repulsed by it but yet we seem sort of curiously unreflective of these things in real life impractical yeah that's impractical (laughs) and yet why is it so impractical Mm. to for for example have girls maintain their mother's name Mm. boys retain their father's name or you know any of the other possibilities why do you need to group people according to a particular way or why do people ever need to be subjugated to a, to, to sort of a, a system in terms of why is it more important to have a system smooth running That's than right. it is to protect an individual's right to you know sort of their heritage, their name, their ability, their, their which is I think comes back to that reproductive control, mm. you know that the way that reproduction has been controlled, women's reproduction is always um, sort of that ultimate source of anxiety, I think. And it's always policed by men. You know, these are, this is a society that is deeply invested with what women do with their bodies, um, with what decisions women are allowed to make and what decisions um, should be made on a kind of social level about who gets to reproduce and when and how and so forth. And, I mean, the way that they justify that in the world of the book is to say, well, okay, well, if we had a crisis in, in fertility and we need to kind of preserve the future but what they're actually doing is just exacting the same kinds of social controls we see exacted now on women's bodies and their potential and their ability to control what they do with their lives I mean like I said this this is discourse that exists it absolutely is and I think it would be completely and utterly remiss of us if we did not at least touch upon the most I think graphic Mm. um, sort of moments of the novel which Mm. is um, I think which actually gives new meaning to the word coupling, really. <laughs> um, you know, because Serena Joy and Offred in, in the most... And, and I think this is where, um, you know, Atwood has this sort of marvellous ability to uh, walk, walk the, actually mm. not even walk, the, but, but make use of the grotesque 
to make use of um, actually it's in places the downright funny because yeah, you know, that's it, right. it, it yeah. is actually there are moments that are absolutely out loud laughable um, in yeah. this and deliberately so. She's, she's so brilliant because she uses that satirical edge to make you laugh but then pull you up and wonder what exactly you're laughing at because you're right that scene in which in which the commander is trying to impregnate Offred while, while Serena Joy is, is, is there behind her I mean it's it's laughable and it's repulsive at the same time you, you, I mean this is essentially rape but at the same time it's such a ridiculous image and so obviously wrong and over the top that it, it kind of walks that really dangerous line between being horrendous to read but also being oddly funny. <laughs> and I don't know how she does it. I don't know how she manages to be both without being horrendously offensive, but yet it works. <laughs> Look, you know, I, I, I think that um, we have this glimpse of, uh, you know, sort of Serena Joy's life that's uh, right. in, in, in that which in has been interesting too yeah. in, in, in sort of that in that moment where somehow um, by ensuring that the wife is present or that the wife is and I think you know this is a, a really fascinating way of exploring the way other women are often complicit that's right um, yeah. in the way that um, sort of I in the very real um, you know sort of and, and, and quite uh, sort of destructive and controlling um, you know sort of uh, forms of abuse well and exactly I mean that's the art I mean they're, they're training women like Offred and Moira into submission and these are women who are absolutely compl complicit with the system Abs and they are parroting all of these destructive discourses back to the women and it's they're, they're the reason that the, the handmaids or part of the reason why the handmaids are the way they are because they've been so thoroughly trained by other women women are, are complicit in these systems but yet how do they get out of them look you know and and i i think it's that um you know sort of it, it's it's that brilliance and outward ability to straddle Mm. problems as as opposed to sort of solve them and I pardon the sort of the, the copulating <laughs> <laughs> you know sort of imagery but it it, it 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 seems apt and you know sort of I think it, at the beginning we, we we talked very much about the way that at the same time that it's impossible to talk about that feminist mm. we um, you know, and yet at the, at the same time um, we must That's because right. without that ability to talk in this language we, we lose the ability to defend, to politicise, to mm. change and, and all of those things that, that follow. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's a great way of, you know, sort of um, making a comment on the way that sort of other women by dint of being women feel as though they're in the position to both comment upon and make decisions on behalf of other women mm. about reproduction, about mm. sexuality, about all of those, um, you know, sort of things that are so very fraught. And so we, we get this play where we can both see the way that someone is, is sort of first and foremost is, you know, sort of I think we get that, that sort of that play between the, the individual, the individual as gendered, the individual as sexual, the individual mm. as, as also part of, of a social network mm. and all of these things that have to be navigated um, in, in order to sort of have a society that in any way functions and, and in the denial of any of those um, you know, sort of very multivalent um, attributes. Uh, you know, we are sort of always and playing with that, um, you know, sort of line of the totalitarian state. Mm. And I think that um, to go to to go back to that point about how Margaret Atwood kind of plays on both sides of the fence in that she makes you laugh and and her um, her satire can be quite sharp. I think it's summed up in a beautiful Latin expression of which I, I cannot remember the Latin but the translation uh, car, car, car bon, what yeah, was, oh, I can't remember it oh now God, unfortunately God. but it translates to don't let the bastards grind you down. And you and I Stephanie are going to be wearing our t-shirts <laughs> special edition t-shirts. We I have we, special we, edition we, Handmaid's Tale t-shirts that we will Nolite be bast oh. something like that. Yeah. But I, we, Michelle and I have special edition Handmaid's Tale t-shirts, which we purchased from Book Riot. And I think any, any keen readers of Margaret Atwood 
might want to, to purchase them too. And that seems to me to be a nice place to wrap up our discussion with Don't Let the Bastards Grind You Down. Words of wisdom from Margaret Atwood, one of our greatest living writers. Thanks, guys, for listening, and we'll be back with you shortly.